Good afternoon, everyone. This is um, the Health and the Public Interest seminar, um, weekly seminar. Um, sorry, I have somehow lost my. Um, can you still see my screen? No. No. Okay, so let me let me pull that back up because it's kind of important. Um, so you're good now, right? Okay, so this is a health and the public interest seminar, weekly seminar, and we're pleased to have um, Carl Elliott with us today, uh, a very well-known speaker and author from University of Minnesota. Pavan Reddy is going to be doing the formal introduction. I just wanna say a couple of words about the program and the seminar series. Um, for the sake of the students, I want to point out that our regular seminars on October 26th and November 2nd have been canceled in favor of a couple of very special seminars that we've been able to identify um, and that we are requiring you to go for, go to um, if possible. We know that some of you have work or, or, or class conflicts, but um, regardless, um, do what you can. And if you're needing to miss one of them, let me know and um, we'll figure out some other activity that you can do to make up for it. But um, one of them is um, preventing opioid deaths by the authors of American Cartel, investigative reporters at the Washington Post. This is going to be a great seminar, and it's on next Wednesday after our regular seminar. So that's going to be, you know, adding to your already busy day, but uh, it's definitely worth it since this is one of the big um, public health issues we talk about in the program. And then um, on October 18th, Dr. Fu Berman's um, Farm Data Organization commissioned a white paper on what needs to change at the FDA, and there's going to be a panel discussion of it on Zoom. You'll all be receiving notices about that, and um, so you're required to go to that unless um, you have a conflict that you tell me about. And um, anybody who's at this seminar should get a notice about that, an invitation. And as well, you can um, get the link for the first seminar either by visiting the O'Neill Institute website at Georgetown, or I'll put it in the chat after I'm done, after, yeah, after the introductions are done. So um, the seminar today, sorry for that long um, prequel, um, is going to be uh, introduced by Pavan, as I mentioned. The way that it's going to roll out is that this, the, after his introduction, Dr. Elliott will present for about 45 minutes. We ask you to keep your microphones muted unless you're instructed otherwise. And um, then that'll be followed by question and answer by seminar students um, and moderated at that point by Pavan still. And then we'll follow up with general questions or discussions with a wider audience. So. Um, Pavan, take it away. Hi, everyone. It's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Carl Elliott. Uh, Dr. Carl Elliott graduated from his undergrad at Davidson College and went on to the Medical University of South Carolina, where he received his medical doctorate. He received his PhD in philosophy at Glasgow in Scotland. And before moving to Minnesota, he held postdoctoral fellowships at the University of Chicago, Otago in New Zealand, and the Nelson R. Mandela School of Medicine. Uh, he also served as the assistant professor at McGill University in Montreal for four years. His recent scholarship has focused on two central areas. Uh, one is wrongdoing in medicine, especially in areas of clinical research and pharmaceutical marketing. And the second is philosoph philosophical issues surrounding identity, authenticity, and justice as seen through the lens of biomedical technology. He's had long-standing interest in the work of Ludwig uh, Wittgenstein and the novelist Walker Percy. And he has gone on to write multiple books, such as White Coat, Black Hat, uh, and is currently working on a book about whistleblowing and medical research supported by a Guggenheim Fellowship and National Endowment for the Humanities Public Scholar Award. Uh, so with that introduction, I will hand things over to Dr. Elliott. Hey, nice to be back virtually at uh, Georgetown again. Let me see if I can get my screen shared for you. All right.
All right. I'm hoping that's working. Yes. Um, so I've just finished writing this um, book about whistleblowers and medical research. It's called Lonesome Whistle, which is kind of after the old uh, Hank Williams song, although spoiler alert, my book has nothing to do with trains. <laughs> um, what I want to do this morning is tell you something of what I've learned while I was writing the book. Um, but I think I need to start by telling you about the experience that sort of plunged me into this issue, which is a case at my own university uh, that some of you will know about. It's about a young mentally ill man named um, Dan Markinson. Let me just tell you briefly about that. Um, so this case begins in the story in the uh, summer of 2003 with these two people, Mary Weiss and her son, Dan. Um, they're from St. Paul. Mary raised uh, Dan as a single mom in St. Paul, where she was a postal worker, and then sent him off to Ann Arbor to do a, uh, a degree in English literature. And when he finished, he moved out to L.A., where this picture was taken, with hopes of becoming a screenwriter. The summer of 2003, Mary goes out to LA to visit Dan. And when she gets there, it's clear that something is wrong. He's behaving really strangely. He's talking about aliens and angels, and he's built a wall of wooden blocks around his bed with $5 bills in between them, which he says is to protect him from the aliens which have been visiting him in his apartment. And he seems to be obsessed with an event that he, seems to think Mary knows something about, but she's got no idea what he's talking about. Um, she just knows that something is badly wrong with him. And eventually by September, she convinces him to come back to Minnesota where she hopes to get him some medical care. Um, by this point, it's starting to become clear that Dan isn't just mentally ill, he's also dangerous. His delusions seem to revolve around this satanic cult that he's convinced is orchestrating some kind of apocalyptic event in Duluth and that he's supposed to play a part in this event and the part he's supposed to play is mass murder. And one of the people he's supposed to murder is Mary, his mother. And you can kind of see the extent of his delusions from his emails that he's sending in September. So he's living with Mary at this point. On November 12th, she gets so alarmed by some of the things that Dan is saying that she calls the police. And they eventually take him to Fairview Hospital, which is our teaching hospital at the University of Minnesota. And he's seen by a university psychiatrist by the name of Stephen Olson, who's the head of the schizophrenia program here at the U. Olson evaluates Dan, thinks he's psychotic, dangerous, incompetent to make medical decisions. So dangerous, in fact, that he needs to be involuntarily committed. Um, Dan is eventually seen by another clinician and also a screening team who essentially say the same thing. He's psychotic, he's incompetent, he's dangerous, he needs to be involuntarily committed. Now, in Minnesota, patients who have been involuntarily committed are given another option, which is called a stay of commitment. And a stay of commitment means that you can avoid being locked up as long as you agree to do what your psychiatrist says. And so on November 20th, that's what Olson recommends. Dan should be given a stay. He can avoid being locked up as long as he does what Olson says. And the court says, okay. Here's where things start to go wrong. Olson then does something unusual. Ordinarily, he would just treat Dan. But instead, he asks him to sign up for a drug study. And Dan says, OK. And he signs the consent form when his mother's not there. So when Mary finds out about this, she is angry. She's stunned. She doesn't want Dan in a study. He's psychotic. He's delusional. He's threatening to murder her. And just a couple of days before, everybody who saw him agreed this guy is incompetent to consent to take neuroleptic drugs. And so if he's incompetent, how is he competent to consent to a study of those very same drugs? And how can his consent be valid if the alternative 
is involuntary commitment. Mary tells Olson, I don't want him in this study. But according to Mary, Olson just said, look, he's an adult. It's his choice, not yours, is in the study. So here is a study that Olson was doing. It's funded by AstraZeneca. It's called the CAFE study. It's aimed at patients having their first psychotic break. It lasts a year. And subjects are assigned to one of three different neuroleptics known as atypical antipsychotic drugs, Seroquel, Risperdal, or Zyprexa. Olson is the PI, his department chair, Chuck Schultz is the co-investigator. This study is generating about $327,000 for the university, which comes out to about $15,000 and change for every subject that they recruit. Both Olson and Schultz are paid consultants for AstraZeneca. So also is the chair of the IRB panel that approves the study. So Dan stays at the hospital on the locked ward for about two more weeks, and then he's transferred to a halfway house in St. Paul. According to Mary, he starts to get much worse. He becomes reclusive. He stops changing his clothes. His thoughts get more grandiose and more delusional. And the most alarming thing to Mary is just how angry and how agitated he becomes. She says he's so tense, it's like he's about to explode any minute. At this point, Mary is trying everything that she can think of to get him out of the study. She is writing letters. She is going to the Department of Psychiatry. She is making phone calls again and again. Finally, in April, she leaves a voice message with the study coordinator saying, do we have to wait until he kills himself or somebody else before anybody does anything? Three weeks after she leaves that message, which she never gets a response to, Early in the morning of May 8th, a police officer and a Catholic priest knock on her door in St. Paul. They're there to tell her that Dan has stabbed himself to death in the shower with a utility knife. In fact, he'd stabbed himself so violently and so many times that he's almost decapitated himself. And his body was discovered early that morning by a halfway house worker along with a note on the nightstand that says, I went through this experience smiling. And later on, toxicology reports show that Dan is being treated with Seroquel, quetiapine, which is the AstraZeneca drug, the drug by the study sponsor. So that's the story. I learned about this case in 2008. Like everybody else, I read about it in the St. Paul Pioneer Press. And then I spent the next seven years trying to get that death investigated. I wrote a magazine article about it for Mother Jones. I filed requests with dozens of different agencies at the university, outside the university, federal government, FDA, OHRP, everything I could think of. I gave probably 60 or 70 presentations and lectures about it. I helped organize petitions, vigils, letter writing campaigns, campus events, and eventually, with the help of a former governor of Minnesota, Arne Carlson, there was a state investigation and it was brutal. Essentially vindicated everything that we had been saying. Everything that I and the other critics of the study had said about it was confirmed. Now I'll tell you that story because there's one thing about it that struck me. During all that time, those entire seven years, not a single doctor or nurse on the faculty at the University of Minnesota gave us any support, not one. Others did. There were faculty members from outside the medical school, faculty members at other universities. Thousands of those people signed petitions and letters and wrote articles and editorials. But on the inside, nothing. Now, what do we make of that? Is that the way that research scandals play out at most institutions? Or is my own institution uniquely bad? Now, that is the question that led me to start teaching a class on medical research scandals in 2016. I taught this class for about six years now. All scandals, all the time, two a week for a term. 
cancer, psychosis, infectious disease, research on homeless people, research on prisoners, research on uh, institutionalized disabled children, whatever variant of exploitation and abuse you're looking for, we've got it in this course. What I wanted to do was to look at a lot of scandals side by side to see if there are common elements. I want to know how do these things usually play out? Short answer to that question, not very well. Research institutions never do the right thing. They deny wrongdoing, they stonewall the press, they protect their own faculty members, they rarely apologize, and they do whatever they can to avoid any compensation to the victims or their families. That's how they usually play out. One thing that really jumped out at me was the way that scandals are generally exposed. Because I'd always thought, before I knew anything about this, I'd always thought that scandals came to light because of one of two reasons. One, because you got some kind of regulator or oversight body that steps in and says no, or because of a whistleblower. You know, some doctor or nurse or insider of some sort who sees what's going on, tries to stop it, it eventually feels morally obligated to go to the press or to an oversight body. Turns out that both of those are pretty rare. In most scandals, there are plenty of doctors and nurses who know what's going on, but they just look away and they do nothing, even when it's clear that patients are being horribly mistreated or abused. And often that happens for years. And so you have to ask yourself, how do they live with themselves? How do they just keep quiet while their patients and research subjects are being so horribly mistreated? Well, this question of silence in the face of wrongdoing, that's a question that social scientists have gotten very interested in over the past 30 years or so. Why do bystanders to wrongdoing stay quiet? One thing you could do is you can ask them, and these social science scientists ask them, and you get three kinds of responses. One, I was afraid of retribution. If I spoke out, I would have lost my job. I would have been punished in some way. The second, blowing the whistle would have been futile. Speaking out wouldn't have accomplished anything. I would just be immolating myself for no reason. And the third is loyalty. I don't rat out my friends. If I got problems with, with what's going on in my group, I keep my concerns in-house. I don't go to the press. This is what people say. But is it true? I'm not so sure. And the reason I'm not so sure is uh, an experiment. And I'm going to tell you about it. It's a psychology experiment about whistleblowing done in the Netherlands um, about 10 years ago. So this is a study that's modeled on those famous Stanley Milgram obedience studies. And in this new version, the researchers wanted to find out whether a group of university students would blow the whistle on a research study that was obviously dangerous. So here's what they did. Got the students all together in a room, tell them we're looking for help recruiting subjects for a study. And then they arrange for them to be approached by a formally addressed scientist who's actually just an actor. I'm imagining somebody like this, you know, guy in a white coat who looks like he knows what he's doing. So they got a fake scientist. This fake scientist tells them about his study. He says, look, this is a sensory deprivation experiment. And so what we're doing is we're taking subjects and then we're locking them in a kind of isolation chamber where they can't see anything or hear anything or feel anything. And then we keep them there for a while and we measure their brain activity to see what happens. I'm imagining an isolation chamber looking look something like this, right? And so the fake scientist says, you know, I, I gotta tell you, um, we've done this experiment once before, kind of a pilot study and you know, it didn't go that well. Um, the subject started to hallucinate and eventually they couldn't think straight anymore. And, you know, they panicked. So two out of the six, two of them tried to get out of that chamber, but 
you know, that would have ruined the results. So we had to keep the door locked. Um, so this time, he says, we're going to repeat the experiment, but he wants to get younger subjects because their brains are even more sensitive to sensory deprivation, which, well, a little worrying, but those are the risks. So what he wants to know of the Dutch students is, will you help me by recommending this, this experiment to your friends and acquaintances? All you have to do is send them a text or an email. Um, we'd like you to get in touch with at least four people. And we want you to use at least two of the words exciting, incredible, great, or superb. So they intentionally designed this, this scenario to make it as easy as possible for subjects to refuse and to blow the whistle. They were given plenty of time to consider their decisions. The fake scientists left the room so nobody would have to directly confront anyone with an authority. In addition, everybody is told that the, that the university's ethics committee is still deciding whether or not to approve this study. And so everybody's given an, a, given a form encouraging them to register any ethical problems they might have to this with this study. And they can do this in complete anonymity. There'll be no way to trace it back to them. So the question is, how many blew the whistle? Now, before I tell you that, there was a kind of ingenious twist to this study because they divided them into two groups. And one group, they presented the study to purely in theory as a kind of hypothetical. In other words, if you were asked to recruit your friends into a study like this, would you do it? And in that case, virtually nobody could imagine themselves cooperating. 96% said that they would either disobey the scientists or blow the whistle or, or both. That was in theory. But in practice, things were just the opposite. When the subjects were actually put in that situation where they actually got the pitch from the fake scientists, over three quarters complied. 75% wrote the emails using words like incredible and superb. How many blew the whistle? 9% less than one in 10. Now, remember what I said earlier, that if you ask people like this, why didn't you blow the whistle? They'll tell you three things. I was afraid of retribution. It wouldn't have accomplished anything. And I don't rat out my own group. And yet in this study, none of those conditions apply. Subjects couldn't have feared retribution. They were guaranteed anonymity. They couldn't have thought that speaking out would be futile because they were told if they objected, the study was going to be shut down. And they couldn't have been acting out of loyalty to the group because there's no group to be loyal to. And yet they went along anyway. They agreed to persuade their friends to sign up for a study that seemed obviously dangerous and deranged. Why? Now, I've got uh, some possible answers to that. But let's just bracket that for a minute. Don't forget about it because we'll come back to it. Um, but for the moment, I want to talk about something else. And this is um, what I found with my book. Because another way to look at this question is not asking bystanders why they kept quiet, but ask whistleblowers why they spoke out. And so that's what I've been doing for the past five or six years or so for my book. So what I did was I took six cases six different research scandals, and I tracked down the people who were responsible for exposing those, those scandals. They were, um, and they were Tuskegee, Willowbrook, Cincinnati Radiation Studies, the unfortunate experiment in New Zealand, the Fred Hutchinson Cancer Center blood uh, cancer study, and the recent synthetic trachea studies done by Paolo Macchiarini at the Karolinska Institute in Sweden. Now, um, you might think this is a fa fairly straightforward question, that there's an easy way to find out why somebody blew the whistle, which is you ask them the question, why did you blow the whistle? Uh, that's what I thought going in. Turns out it's pretty complicated because when you actually talk to whistleblowers and you ask them that question, what you find is that they explain their actions 
very often with a kind of non-explanation, kind of explanation that doesn't get you very far and doesn't even really seem to answer the question. They don't give you moral arguments. They don't appeal to any kind of foundational principles. They don't cite legal statutes. They don't quote the Bible. They don't talk about the Hippocratic Oath. Instead, they say things like, that's just how I was raised. Or what would I say to my children if I didn't do anything? Or how can I keep quiet and look at myself in the mirror every morning? So they answer, answer with these kind of weird non-answers. So let me give you an example. And like a lot of my examples, this one leads back to Richard Nixon, who I have kind of an obsession with. Um, my kids have Voldemort, I have Nixon. Um, if you remember the Senate Watergate hearings in the summer of 1973, which I'm sure you all do, um, there's one moment that's probably seared into your brain, and it's this one, the moment where Alexander Butterfield, White House aide, tells the Senate Watergate Committee that Nixon had installed a secret taping system in the Oval Office. This is the pivotal moment in Nixon's downfall. This was the moment where the hard evidence of his crimes couldn't be hidden anymore. I don't want to talk about what Butterfield did, though. What I want to point out is how he explained it afterwards. Because when he was asked later, why did you do it? He just said, I answered truthfully because I'm a truthful person. In other words, I did it because that's the kind of person I am which on the surface seems to explain both nothing and everything. Obvious how it explains nothing. How do I, what do I mean when I say it explains everything? Well, um, what it explains is this. Whistleblower narratives are essentially stories about the self. So for whistleblowers, the choice, do I speak up or do I stay quiet? That's a choice about the kind of person they are and the kind of person they want to be, which means it's not an abstract question. The thing that torments whistleblowers is what will this decision reveal about me? They're worried about the state of their souls. So take, for example, this man, Ron Jones. Ron is one of the three doctors who exposed the so-called unfortunate experiment the cervical cancer experiment at National Women's Hospital in Auckland, New Zealand. And when I asked Ron what tipped the balance for him, what it was that made him think, you know, I got to do something. And he just said, well, you know, my Presbyterian background said, Ron, you, you better get involved. It's probably a reflection of the nature of the man I am. Very similar with John Pisando at the Hutch. Pisando says, I'd like to think I've never hurt another person in this life, at least not deliberately, and that's just who I am. Now, to me, that sounds a lot like Alexander Butterfield. Why did I do it? Because I'm the kind of man who does that. Now, I've got to say, I'm not the first person to notice these kind of non-explanations. One of my favorite books on whistleblowing is by Fred Alford, a political scientist at the University of Maryland, who spent years interviewing whistleblowers. And he's, he admires them. But he's struck by how often whistleblowers turn moral questions about the well-being of others into a moral question about themselves. He says, look, even if they feel empathy for victims, even if they're acting out of principle, that's not what they talk about. What they talk about is themselves, about facing their kids, about looking in the mirror. He calls that narcissism moralized. He thinks whistleblowers are obsessed with their own moral purity. I love Alfred's book, I think it's terrific, but I think he's wrong about this. When I talk to whistleblowers, I don't hear narcissism moralized or not. What I hear is the ethic of honor and shame. Yes, whistleblowers talk a lot about themselves. That's what honor and shame are all about. They're about maintaining your self-respect 
by holding yourself accountable for your moral failures. That's the, distinguish, this, that's the distinguishing feature of the ethic of honor. It's about your obligations to yourself. So of course whistleblowers talk about themselves. That's perfectly natural. Now, every time I speak the word honor, I feel awkward. And I feel like I need to step back and explain because it feels like a word from another era. You know, feels archaic and absolute like duels over insults. Now, the standard view of honor is the one that the sociologist Peter Berger wrote about in his essay on the obsolescence of the concept of honor. So Berger argued, honor is an old concept. It's rooted in the pre-modern world, a world of social hierarchy. This is a world where a person's rights and obligations depend on their social station. And so when social hierarchy started to collapse in the 18th century, honor collapsed too. And in the place of honor arose the concept of dignity. Dignity is different from honor. In the ethic of honor, your worth comes from your social station. With dignity, your worth comes from your status as a human being. Dignity is universal. It extends to everybody. It's a terrific essay, but I think it's only half true. Honor isn't obsolete any more than shame is obsolete. We use the word. We know what it means. We even take it seriously in some corners of the culture, like the military or those strange liberal arts colleges with honor codes. What happened to honor was not a disappearance, it was a change of address. What happened is the locus of honor shifted from a person's social station to their standing as an individual. This is the beginning of a modern concept of honor, which is about the idea of being true to yourself and your own values, despite social pressure to do otherwise. This is when honor starts to become attached to dissent. So Frank Barrett and Theodore Sarbin made this argument in an essay called Honor is a Moral Category. And they did something interesting. Again, another empirical study. They asked 45 officers in the Navy to write a story about some incident where they saw honor at work. Not a single officer wrote about upholding their status or their reputation or responding to an insult. What they wrote about was staying true to an authentic inner voice despite external pressure. So their honor stories were all about doing the right thing, even at the risk of losing their status or damaging their career. So what do I mean by the ethic of honor? Well, the ethic of honor is, is fundamentally about respect and self-respect. That's what people mean when they say things like, how can I hold my head up? What they're getting at is, how can I respect myself? Because honor is not just about getting respect from others, although that is very important. That's why insults require a, a response in the honor ethic. But it's also about deserving respect. Because in the ethic of honor, you want to be the kind of person who is worthy of the respect you get. If you fail, you feel ashamed. That's not wounded narcissism. That's what happens when an honorable person fails to measure up to the honor code. Because the flip side to honor is shame. And if you don't feel ashamed when you fail morally, if you don't feel ashamed when you're cowardly or cruel, you're not really honorable. And by shame, shame is different from guilt. Guilt is personal and individual. Shame requires an imagined audience. It's about the judgment of other people. Shame is what you feel at the thought of your sins and your failures being exposed. So that's what I found in my book. I've talked about whistleblowers now. I've talked about their sense of honor. Let me finish by turning back to bystanders who are the silent ones. And I wanna go back to that study I mentioned. Why did all those people fail to blow the whistle when they were certain that they would do it? It wasn't a fear of punishment. It wasn't a sense of futility. And it wasn't a sense of group loyalty. According to the authors, 
the problem is a kind of reflexive obedience to authority. This all comes from Milgram, right? When we're told to do something by a person we see as a legitimate authority, most of us just do it. That was the lesson of the original Stanley Milgram study, the electrical shock study, right? In most circumstances where there's a person that we see as a legitimate authority, a teacher in a classroom, a flight attendant on an airplane, an usher at the theater, in those circumstances, we just do as we're told. Now, if you go back to that original Milgram study, the one where people obeyed orders to give electrical shocks or what they thought were electrical shocks, you'll also remember that it pointed towards a solution. Because Milgram did dozens of different studies where he manipulated the conditions of the study, right? And what he found is that he could tip the scales away from obedience and towards the demands of conscience if he manipulated the conditions of the study, right? So one thing that would help, for example, is to deflate the prestige of the authority figure. So the original studies were done at Yale where he was on the faculty. He tried, let me move it out to a community building in Bridgeport. How does it work there? Well, when he did that, more people resisted. But what he found was the biggest change was when he placed dissenters in the room, right? If the fake scientist was accompanied by a second fake scientist who objected to the shocks or raised questions, there wasn't a single subject who was willing to continue to give them. And if the subject was placed at the, sub at the table with two other subjects, actually fake subjects, who refused to administer shocks, then that subject was emboldened to resist as well. In other words, subjects are far more likely to follow their consciences if they didn't feel so isolated and alone in their dissent. And that's what I found in the cases that I wrote about in my book as well. Rarely is there a single whistleblower. Usually there are many. So with the unfortunate experiment in New Zealand, there were three. With the Macchiarini scandal, there were four. With Willowbrook, there was an entire activist collective. And this was also true at the University of Minnesota with the Markinson case. It wasn't just me protesting. There was my colleague in the Bioethics Center, Lee Turner, and a nurse at Fairview Hospital named Nikki Jerry, and eventually a whole group of faculty and students at the university, none in the medical school, even years later, the doctors in the medical school still haven't come around. Um, but in the wider university, yes. And so if there were any moral to the story, any lesson that I'd like to leave you with, it would be this. This was told to me by um, Tom Devine there in Washington, DC. The watchword of the whistleblower is solidarity. That's what ignites the spark. That's also what's essential for the whistleblower to survive what is likely to be a very, very long ordeal. Acting alone, that's a suicide mission. When whistleblowers succeed, it's usually because a group of them has acted together. All right, I'm done, but that's okay. So I think I'll stop there and stop sharing my screen. Okay, so while Pavan is uh, pulling together his thoughts and maybe looking at the chat a little bit, I just wanted to just quickly say thank you, Carl. As always, that was a very um, eloquent and, um, and, and important uh, set of uh, thoughts that you passed on to us. And, um, you know, part of the untold story here is um, I guess your role in it, which um, I want to just thank you for um, everything you do to um, protect experimental subjects and through your work. Um, so, Pavan. Thank you so much, Dr. Elliot. Uh, we're gonna open the floor to questions from happy students first. So if any happy students have questions they'd uh, like to ask, Please raise your hand, I'll call on you. Um, 
Uh, big Brian. Um, thank you for this presentation, Dr. Elliott. Um, it seems to me that to, to your last point about uh, groups, that generally when we hear in the press about whistleblowers, we're hearing about individuals. Um, is that a bias of the press to focus on individuals or is that because those succeed more often or you know, why, why is it that we don't hear a lot and maybe I'm just missing it when it's out there, but I feel like I don't hear a lot about groups that have acted as whistleblowers. This is true. Um, and, and that's what I expected as well. It was really only when I, um, when I started to dig that I found out that there was usually actually a group um, behind the single one. Um, I, I will say uh, it's definitely not because um, what you're reading about in the press is um, more likely to be pe people who've succeeded. The whistleblowers rarely succeed. I would say almost never. And even when um, by outward measures, it looks as if they've succeeded, what you'll find is they feel as if they've failed. Um, this is this is one of the one of the other things that um, was really striking to me in talking to the whistleblowers in this book. Most of them are marked in a really very deep way. The experience is kind of deeply kind of damaging, traumatizing things that they struggle with for the rest of their lives. Um, it's it's really a rare person. I wouldn't say that they're, you know, it's impossible, but uh, because, um, you know, I can name one or two who seem to have come through the, ex the experience uh, pretty much unscathed. But for the most part, um, they're really pretty deeply damaged. Um, why, you know, why there's usually one in, um, in the press is usually because, uh, you know, I think some people are more comfortable talking to the press. Um, very often there's one person who starts it and then others um, kind of join in. Very often with a, with, when there's a group, there's a leader of the group. But what you'll find, um, and then sometimes um, there's not. Uh, you know, what I found, I mean, the, you know, the group is very self-conscious. So um, I don't know how many of you are familiar with the um, Machiarini scandal with the Karolinska, um, which was exposed in 2016. But there were four whistleblowers there. And they were very intentional about the idea that they were working together. They, no one spoke to anybody without checking it out with the rest of the group. Um, if they did speak to anyone privately, they taped it and brought it back to the group. They made all their decisions collectively um, because they understood from the very beginning that um, the only way that they could succeed was by acting together. Um, that's actually kind of rare though. Um, mostly, I think, you know, I remember um, this whistleblower at, uh, out in Seattle, John Passando, said something to me, uh, something to the effect that um, every whistleblower is an amateur playing against professionals. And I think that's, you know, in most cases, that's true. Most people have no idea what they're doing before they, uh, before they start. And what happens is kind of a, sh a shock to them. Um, you know, yeah, I should, I should stop there. And then, uh, Birna. Yeah, um, thank you so much for this presentation, but I have a, a question that you kind of touched on, um, but what is something that we can do? Most of us are going to be working in public health. What is something that we can do if we come across someone who wants to talk about their experience or break a story? How do we protect whistleblowers? So um, what's kind of like the first step? Do we connect them to a reporter? Um, what's something that you would encourage us to do? I think the, the first thing that everybody, well, I mean, 
there, there, there are all kinds of things that you need to do before you talk to a reporter. One is to make sure that you're not uh, you're not acting alone. You need to get corroboration from as many other people as possible. Um, two, you need to you need to collect evidence for whatever allegations you're making um, because you're going to be hit back it, it, as soon as anybody knows who is blowing the whistle. If you have a vulnerability in any way, they're going to hit back at you very hard. And they're going to claim that you're crazy or that you have a vendetta or that there's there's something wrong with you. They're going to dig up anything that they can find out about you to discredit you in some way. Um, so you need to be prepared for that. Um, Tom Devine, who is probably you know, as an attorney has probably dealt with more whistleblowers than anybody in, in the United States, says that when he, he told me that um, he was with the Government Accountability Project, he says, you know, the first thing I tell potential whistleblowers when they come to me is don't do it. Um, because once you do it, there's no going back and you're going to be punished. If at all possible, let us do it for you, right? Give us the evidence, give us whatever you can, and then get the information out without the possibility of it being connected to you. Now, in most of the cases that I talk, I think that may well work. I mean, I, I'll just have to trust Tom on this. Um, uh, but, it, you know, he deals mainly with government and corporate whistleblowers. With most of the whistleblowers that I talk to, there's really no possibility of staying anonymous or keeping it secret, right? I mean, th the only way that these people could have made the issue public is by going public themselves, but they have to be prepared. Um, a third thing that I would wanna say is talk to, an, talk to an, a lawyer before you do it. I mean, this is something that I heard again and again that people didn't even really think about. It's not something, you know, I think some people have the idea, particularly if they work in universities, that there are protections um, given to them by virtue of academic freedom and tenure and so on that can protect them from retribution. And um, let me just say, <laughs> They, they do protect you in some way, but there are so many different ways that you can be um, that you can be punished that you never even thought about um, that you need to prepare yourself for. Uh, any other happy students have any questions? Uh, before we open it up to the general audience. All right. Uh, well, I actually happen to have a, one question. Uh, I guess adding on to that last discussion, how can we better prepare ourselves if we are going through like whistleblowing or other kind of resistance uh, or pushback? Uh, how do we deal with the immediate aftermath more effectively and try and like mitigate some of that like uh personal attack on us my screen is frozen up was that you carl saying your screen is frozen yeah my screen is frozen up but now it's okay so okay. Uh, uh, I, missed, okay. I missed the last piece of that um could you so, yeah uh so like how can we better prepare ourselves to like mitigate the pushback that we would receive upon whistleblowing uh I, I know you've mentioned like collecting evidence, making sure that we have better information, working together as a group collectively. Um, but I guess like with the way that certain uh, groups tend to do like personal attacks or like attack our employment, attack uh, through social media, et cetera, how do we kind of anticipate those or how do we uh, work better to deal with that? You know, I, I don't think I can, um emphasize enough the the importance of not trying to do this alone. So here's what happens. I mean, I think what you have to prepare yourself for is um, 
the loss of, I guess, the, the loss of respect from the people that you respect. You have to prepare yourself from being sort of cast out of the group um, that you're a part of. Because once the whistleblower speaks out, they become radioactive. People that they thought that they were their friends, they find out are not their friends. They side with the other, with the other side. People stop speaking to them. People are afraid to be around them because, um, you know, if I'm seen with this person, other people might think that I'm on their side. And then the deep hole that they dug for themselves, I'll be in it with them. And you know, particularly if you're part of, um, if your identity is tied up with what you do for a living, with your identity as a doctor, for example, or a nurse, to find out that suddenly all of the colleagues whose respect you've been working for and who's become essential for who you think you are as a person, where you get your value, what the meaning of your life is about to a large extent, that all those people have sort of cast you out of the group, right? So then the question is, you know, how do you keep that from destroying you? And one, one way is another group, right? This is part of what the group of whistleblowers, um, you know, working together with a group of like-minded dissenters does. It gives people the sense that they can maintain their self-respect, that they're not completely worthless, they're not completely isolated and alone because they have another group that's actually telling them, you know, you did the right thing. I think people, you know, when people think about retribution, they're thinking about very concrete things. They're thinking about things like, um, what if I get fired? Or what if my pay gets docked? Or what if I get demoted? Or what if I get a ding on my record? Or something like this. Those kinds of things most, most people can withstand, but it's this kind of social death that I think people don't anticipate and then they don't quite understand how painful and sort of life-destroying it is until it happens to them. And then they have to kind of remake themselves. Thank you. Uh, Brian and then Dr. Myers. Um, if you mentioned uh, laws protecting whistleblowers, I'm sorry I missed it, but it sounds like you, you're, you're, you're not indicating that whistleblower laws are effective at protecting whistleblowers. Is that right? Um, I think they are, but they don't really apply to the kind of whistleblowing that I've been talking about. Um, the Whistleblower Protection Act protects whistleblowers in the federal government. And there are state whistleblower laws as well, um, but they vary from state to state. And they essentially protect whistleblowers from the kinds of demotions and punishment and loss of jobs uh, and, and so on um, that I'm talking about. They can't protect you against, I mean, there's no whistleblower law that can say, you know, people have to still treat you like a human being, you know. Um, there's no whistleblower law that says your friends can't stop being your friends. Uh, I don't think that you can legislate these kinds of things. And often they're the, you know, they're the most painful things. Those are the things that stick with people for the rest of their lives. So Carl, I just have a quick question. So it seems to me that in this area of university research and clinical research um, that it's all about something called compliance, right? And it's all about checking boxes and figuring out ways that we can do what we want to do 
in the face of obstacles, um, making sure that the university or the investigator is eligible to get funds. Um, it's all sort of directed in this kind of, I don't know, legalistic world where, you know, the compliance officers are even lawyers usually. And, um, you know, you go to them about a conflict of interest or whatever, and what they want to do is figure out a way to manage that conflict and make it look good, make it okay to deal with. Um, do you agree with that statement? And is there some other way to sort of to, to recast all of this in a way that's more positive or um, constructive? I, I do agree with it. And I think it's unfortunate. I mean, here's the thing. Um, we, we've set up a research oversight system that, that's essentially an honor code, right? It's not, a, it's not a real regulatory system in that sense, you know? Uh, you know, no, if you run a restaurant, the health inspectors come in and actually check to make sure that the kitchen is clean and that there are no rats, right? And that you're not going to poison anybody. Nobody does that with researchers. You just have a kind of paper uh, oversight system where you check a bunch of boxes. And we just trust researchers to do the right thing, that if they say they're doing something they're actually doing and if they say they're not doing something they're not actually doing it right it's an honor system but it's not managed like any kind of honor system right it's managed like a vast bureaucracy and that tends to undermine the honor aspects of it right if you actually go to these few kind of small liberal arts colleges usually in the south that have honor codes you know, my alma mater, Davidson College, or Washington and Lee, or Haverford College, or places that have serious honor codes, they treat them very seriously. It's not like a compliance procedure. It's not like a bureaucratic, um, you know, box ticking exercise. People are made, they go through ceremonies, they take oaths, it is impressed on people that this is an extremely important thing, that, that we are not going to watch you take your tests. We trust you not to cheat. And it feels as if treating the entire um, oversight system in the same way that we treat, you know, a trip to the Bureau of, of Motor Vehicles or the Internal Revenue Service, it undermines this sense that this actually is a matter of ethics and of honor and of personal responsibility. All right, thank you. Uh, I think we're gonna open the floor to non-happy students. So first hand that I see is Simon. Thank you. Um, I was anticipating um, the scenario that a friend of mine was involved in um, being part of a lab and uh, seeing some, uh, uh, you know, uh, sort of, let's say downplaying of safety concerns when they were developing a drug candidate and she knew it was wrong and she you know um and one other example was there was an animal behavior researcher at harvard who was kind of falsifying data to make it to kind of support his career story and he ended up getting unseated um can you talk about that scenario because a lot of these whistleblowers you've talked about have been external so what about when they're inside the team oh all the ones i've talked about are inside the team the the only the only difference, well, sort of inside the team, there there are at varying distances uh, from the actual. But you know, all with the exception of a couple, usually people who are on the inside and and see the wrongdoing for themselves. Um, the cases that you're talking about are important, and there are whistleblowing scenarios there as well. I decided not to write about issues of fraud and manipulation of data um, for this book, partly because it's not something that I have a lot of personal experience with. Those things are handled bureaucratically um, in a very different kind of way than 
research that involves abuses of human subjects. Usually there's an office in a, there's a federal office of research integrity. There are procedures within a university that involve, uh, you know, how to handle allegations of fraud or cooking data or boiling data or whatever. Um, but they're handled in different ways. There's, it also extends well beyond medicine because you have fraud in other areas of science as well. So it's not something that I know really that much about. Um, so I, I, I can't really comment on it. What I can't, I mean, I do think the underlying issues about whistleblowing, about the importance of solidarity, about the importance of gathering evidence and so on still apply. Um, but, you know, I think it would be a very interesting comparative study to see if, those, if, if whistleblowing in those kinds of cases actually succeeds more than the cases of um, abuses to human subjects. Because it's my impression that it does. But again, that's not, uh, that's not an expert opinion. All right, uh, the next question is from Talia. Hi, yeah, thank you. Um, thank you so much for your work. I love what, what everyone is talking about here today. Um, I was curious, are you familiar with active bystandership? Uh, I think they're trying to change company cultures and empower and teach individuals that they do have a responsibility to themselves and society to do the right thing and to change the viewpoint from you know, it's wrong to rat people out to, well, if you don't say anything, then you're actually complicit in the action. Um, do, you, do you have any familiarity with that effort? I don't. Um, how do they do that? They train, they do a whole, I, you know, I've never done the training. I've only heard talk about it. I know that the DC police department uh, instituted that um, sometime last year. Um, and they just, they, I think they do a lot of scenarios. I think they, they talk about different situations where, you know, um, a junior person didn't speak up even though they knew there was something really wrong going on and then a tragic accident happened, you know, things like that. And they just try to, they just try to get people to change their viewpoint. And then they also create, try to start, you know, having that training, then they're creating a culture where everybody needs to be on their best behavior. And, you know, even if you're a junior, you can call out your senior, you know, things like that. And it, yeah, it just, it seems like a, a step in the really the right direction, the right conversation. I, I don't know about that. I'd be curious to know if it actually works. Um, one of the things I think that is a, a kind of depressing um, consequence of that study that I cited about the, the Dutch students is that it, it seems like a it seems like a very discouraging result for people like um, you know philosophers, ethicists who have the idea that more education is going to produce more courage, essentially, or more dissent. Because, I mean, by having those two scenarios side by side, what it suggests is that the problem is not anything to do with a lack of knowledge, right? People understood that this was crazy. And then, in, in, you know, in theory, they said, you know, I would never do that. But then in the actual scenario, they did. So I wouldn't say that that's an impossible thing to train people to do, but it does seem as if the idea of training them to do it just with a kind of educational, um, you know, just, just by a kind of learning scenario and teaching them more is unlikely to work. Maybe what you're suggesting, though, involves you know more than that, and you know maybe it would. It would definitely, it would definitely be uh, sort of a welcome change if it did work. Yeah, cool. Yeah, I, I understand what you're saying. I think I think what you, what you mentioned about the Dutch study is that people do know what the right thing to do is, but they don't always have the know how of how to handle that, and they and they're scared. You know, and so if you could, if you really make that the culture, I think you can empower individuals to go with their gut 
because they do know it's wrong, you know, and if you make it safe for them or safer and give them routes to do it, um, at least it's a start, but thank you. Uh, and then we have a question from Robert. Yeah, hi. Um, I have to be a little careful here because the settlement I reached with uh, the University of Mississippi after I was a whistleblower uh, required me to sign a mutual non-disparagement agreement. But uh, the reason I sued the University of Mississippi was because on my annual review, I was told that I was uh, exhibiting contumacious behavior, which is actually in our contract. It's a fancy word for insubordination. And it is one of the few things that they can use to revoke your tenure. So the thing that I did, well, actually, I had a very good attorney who had the foresight to sue in federal court instead of state court. And we were able to reach a settlement and I was able to survive. And I've been here at NOVA for 13 years now. And um, I think I'm one of the, the rare people who was fortunate enough to survive a whistleblowing incident. When this is done, I'm going to Google you. How's that? I said, when this is finished, I'm going to Google you and see. <laughs> okay. Learn, well, learn more well, than, uh, than what I'd you're about to say. I'd love to chat with you more because um, one of my students in my bioethics class is doing a book report on white coat, black hat. And she brought it to the attention of the class because it was relevant to the uh, collaborative research module we were doing in the class yesterday. So um, you you uh, have a great influence on my bioethics class, and I really appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, and then we have a question from Joel. Hi, Carl. Hey, Good Joel. to see you. Um, so five out of the six um, episodes that you um, write about in your book are from the US, and the one from New Zealand is also coming from um, a Western culture. So I'm wondering if you have any idea whether or not whistleblowing and the consequences are different in other cultures. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, and I don't know. Um, you know, all I can say is that uh, in New Zealand and in Sweden, it didn't really seem that different um, from what we see in the States. And, you know, the case that we all know about from Canada, which is Nancy Oliveri's case, again, not all that different. Um, it would be interesting to know. I mean, if, if there were, um, well, okay. Um, the case of the COVID whistleblower in China. Um, we know things turned out very badly for him. I'm sure that I'm sure the details uh, would um, would vary from culture to culture and also from historical period to historical period. But it, it would surprise me if there were a culture where whistleblowers did um, very well. That said, you know, that's just a guess. That's a good question. I wish I knew the answer. Uh, and then another question that we have, or at least that I have is, in your article, why uh, clinical ethicists aren't activists, and then your work on how market forces are corrupting medical professionals or medical doctors, uh, you talk about how it's difficult due to structures and institutions uh, that surround individuals to like really change things or to really work to push back against uh, corrupting influences. What are some ways that people can kind of do that that extend outside of whistleblowing? Well, I mean, the, you know, the, the two examples that you that you bring up are examples of structures that are designed to produce um, 
you know, a given result. I mean, clinical ethics, which is something that I have some familiar familiarity with, uh, <laughs> you know, the idea that a clinical ethicist hired in an academic medical center, which is structured in an extraordinarily deeply hierarchical way, very traditional, very authoritarian. And that a, that a clinical ethicist on their own could somehow change and do what nobody else has been able to do with the structure of, um, of academic medicine for you know, a century or more, it seems almost laughable to me. I mean, clinical ethicists are hired as consultants. They're there as advisors. They're, you know, they're there to uh, sort of whisper in the ear of the king or the queen, right? They don't have any, they, you know, whatever power they have is power behind the throne. They don't have any traditional power in the institution. And there is no, there's really no way for them to gain any power in the institution. Um, that's the whole point of a clinical ethicist. You know, they're consultants or um, advisors. And if they become problematic in some way, they're gone. Usually clinical ethicist is, is you know, hired on a one or two year contract. They can be fired at will. Um, Often they, I mean, they don't even have the predictions of tenure. And so um, I'm not saying that there's no way to do any good as a clinical ethicist. I think, you know, it, it is possible. Um, what I think is that it has never really occurred to bioethicists that there's any other way other than to try to insinuate any other way to change what's wrong with academic medicine, to improve the condition of patients, you know, to fight injustice in any way, other than becoming a medical insider. But there is, of course. I mean, you can attack institutions from the outside. This is the lesson of the sort of activist movements of the 1960s and 70s, right? Um, and yet that seems to be something that um, bioethicists have always, it's either never occurred to bioethicists or they always shied away from. Um, so, um, the only way to make any kind of change